Hi, my name is Dr. Danielle Curran. I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I direct the Philip Walker Bioarchaeology Laboratory. I'm really excited to be here today to share with you a little bit about my work. We'll be talking in depth about how we can study uh, the remains of the dead to reconstruct their life ways and say something about the social and cultural significance of the patterns we're seeing. Great. So today we'll be talking about uh, how we can use human remains to reconstruct the lives of past individuals. Um, I want to note first off that this presentation contains kind of images of human remains and depictions of violence. So these can be um, triggering to some people, but I use them judiciously as a means to illustrate some of the points I want to emphasize and also show you how uh, bioarchaeologists or forensic anthropologists uh, actually studies and analyzes human remains. So I'm going to take you today to the, uh, the deepest, uh, most uh, isolated uh, part of the Andes. Uh, it's an area that we think of uh, when we kind of imagine kind of the Peruvian or Andean culture. It's an area where uh, uh, snow peaked uh, mountains of the Andean Cordillera uh, drop down into lush uh, indeed, almost junk cloud, uh, lush cloud forests. Um, and it's these waters, it's this area of Peru, uh, that actually forms the headwaters of the Amazon region. I'm going to take you today specifically to a region known as Apurimac, which is a Quechua, indigenous Quechua word that means uh, the area where the gods speak. Uh, this is an area today that is uh, mostly uh, indigenous. Their first language is not Spanish, it's, it's Quechua. Uh, people here also uh, still remain uh, one of the poorest, uh, not only in Peru, but in greater South America. Uh, rates of infant mortality, rates of uh, anemia and malnutrition are exceedingly high. People here are also in the bottom, uh, uh, bottom 20% in terms of uh, income with people, uh, the average uh, salary being about uh, uh, $300 uh, a month for a professional. Now, this is an area uh, where uh, we still see limited involvement of the state. It's an area that for thousands of years has maintained um, a uh, a connection to the Pachamama, the Mother Earth God, um, and the uh, the natural environment, which they, which local people believe has uh, its own kind of life and its own spirit. It's also an area that, in the 1530s, witnessed the incursion by a, a small group of uh, uh, Spanish uh, conquistadors, uh, and uh, with that. Uh, subsequent colonization and uh, conversion. So this is an area too that still has strong uh, Catholic beliefs. However, what Indians do is they, what we see here is what's called syncretism. We see a hybridization or a mixing of the Catholic traditions with those kind of pre-Columbian ancient traditions that people have. More recently, uh, between about 1980 and 2000, uh, the region was one of the most affected during Peru's war, which took place between um, uh, a really unconscionable uh, military and uh, the Shining Path, which was a uh, Maoist terrorist group. Now, unfortunately, both sides in that civil war targeted the people of Apurimac, the indigenous Quechua-speaking locals. Uh, the Shining Path uh, said, you know, we think you are conspiring you know, with the military, the military said, we think you're conspiring with the terrorists. What did that cause? Well, 20 years of, of civil war and really genocidal violence resulted in the disappearance of uh, 70,000 people, the forced migration of over a million 
uh, a quarter million uh, indigenous women were uh, uh, forcibly sterilized. Uh, this is an area where uh, child soldiering was used um, and an era and a time uh, where we see uh, not only you know, young men or combatants targeted, but women, children, the elderly, the sick, and the frail. It's only now uh, that uh, recently that Peru has come to terms with this past through their Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, and now we're starting to see, or we're going through kind of the growing pains of, uh, of how to deal with reparations for what was a, a very dark period in uh, the history of Peru and the Andes writ large. Nevertheless, despite all those hardships from uh, ancient catastrophes, which we'll talk about, to colonial incursion, to more recent kind of ethnocidal or genocidal violence, people here are resilient. They still proudly maintain their customs, their beliefs, uh, their, uh, and their generosity of spirit. Um, it's an area where we can um, use knowledge of our culture, use knowledge of the language, of the archaeology, and indeed even the human bodies themselves to talk about the long, the long dray, the long chain of history of this region. Now, 800 years ago, uh, you know, in the mountains of Apurimac, Peru, we see, we see something happen, an interesting phenomenon. It's uh, something that we see, we see kind of circumstantial evidence for war, or at least rumors of war. We see that evidence in old colonial chronicles where uh, witnesses, indigenous, mestizo, European at the time, were writing down their observations and they describe this area and this time of Peru as one that has a long history of, of violence and of warfare. We also see signs that people are, have increasing concerns about their safety and, and community security. We see people move from the wide, the wide valleys up to mountain peaks, uh, up to hill forts that are constructed with uh, ramparts and ditches and curtain walls and circular walls. There are weapons caches. These sites are, are aimed at defense. There are no water sources at these sites. People had to leave the confines of the hill forts uh, to get basic uh, resources. And, at that, and they were also outside of the, of the walls uh, targeted for uh, violence. But as a bioarchaeologist, we want to interrogate those, uh, those clues from history, from archaeology, and say, what do the bones tell us? Why do we think that? Well, bioarchaeology is kind of founded on the idea that the human body is the most direct reflection of the lived experience. And if we can reconstruct parts of the life history of that body from birth uh, through uh, life, through death and after death, we can understand something about the individual, their social groups, and the society writ large. Now this is no easy task, uh, but it involves uh, collaboration uh, with UCSB students, with students from uh, Peru, with students from Europe, with students from other places in Latin America. And uh, these close collaborations uh, foster um, collaborative relationships that exist beyond kind of the mere summer experience into really productive uh, uh, working groups that produce intellectual products of, of significance. So field work is not easy. It's not for everyone. Um, but for those <laughs> who can deal with the tight squeezes and the, and, uh, and the uh, conditions, there's a lot of spiders in these burial caves I'm going to show you. Ugh. But uh, for those who can take it, uh, who have the, the patience, the moxie, the grit, uh, and again, kind of uh, the grace and mindfulness, this can be a, a, a rewarding experience. So here I am. Here we are with our students. Uh, and we're, uh, this is uh, 
typical of what a bioarchaeologist will do. They'll go to a, a, an archaeological site. Uh, these are burial caves, kind of cave ossuaries, and slowly, meticulously excavate them. Now that we're doing ancient DNA analysis, uh, we have to be more mindful even about how we dress. It used to be kind of throwing on a pair of overalls and getting into the field. And now we wear, uh, uh, we wear a lot of PPE, uh, mostly so we don't contaminate those ancient and precious samples. Of course, lab work is another component of our work, and that includes everything from skeletal analysis to uh, biogeochemical analyses, uh, 3D scanning and morphometrics, uh, really the um, kind of the full gamut of in our archaeological or bioarchaeological toolkit uh, we use to answer, again, to answer questions of significance and to interpret the life ways of people who no longer have a voice. And of course, with that comes conservation. So the Andes is actually pretty, pretty incredible. Our word for beef jerky actually comes from the Quechua word charqui, which is a, a freeze-dried llama. And so we're dealing with a, a, a high altitude area, one that is uh, cold, one that is dry, and those conditions actually favor the mummification of soft tissue. So for example, this is typical of one of the uh, uh, trophy heads we'll find. You can see that there's a borehole in the head where it might have been hung by a string. But the preservation is such that 800 years later, we can still see uh, the, you know, the iris, uh, what's left of the irises, the eyebrows and eyelashes. What's particularly interesting about uh, uh, one of my students noticed this is that this uh, trophy head is actually wearing an earring made out of human hair. Now, what we're doing now is testing whether that hair belongs to this individual or whether it's some kind of trophy. It belongs, it's, it's from some other individual and we'll be able to do that. Other, you know, we have mummies that are various levels of preservation. So the one right over here, the one who's kind of, uh, the individual whose head is in his hands, uh, he actually still has his nails uh, conserved. And we can use those, those nails grow at a continuous rate. So we can do things like uh, look at the elemental composition of those nails and see what that individual was eating in the 18 months before they died. Uh, the other image here is a, a child mummy, uh, potentially uh, one of the Capacocha or Inca sacrifice mummies. One of the things that uh, clues us into this is kind of the elaborate, uh, the elaborate way that this, uh, this mummy has been kind of decorated. And also you may notice kind of a red tint. That tint is cinnabar. It's a, it's a red pigment, pigment that has important kind of sacred um, implications in the Andes. And it suggests someone of a high and sacred important status. When we take, we realized that the, the mummy itself, the headband was actually holding a wig. And when we removed the wig, we could see that the child uh, have, has uh, uh, an artificially elongated head. And this is another practice that we tend to see in Peru. We call it cranial modification. So when a baby in, in, the, in ancient Apurimac was born, a uh, few days after birth, the mother or another caregiver would start to wrap the head in bindings, kind of turban-like bindings. They may have been bound to a cradle. And those bindings were readjusted over time, but they were left on for several years. And by the time a, a child was about five or six, their skull had actually been, become remolded into an artificially elongated shape. Now, kind of what the amount of elongation and the shape of the head really depends on where you're putting the bindings and how intense those bindings are and how long they're placed. Now, uh, I, I don't know if you guys know, there's this kind of famous Peruvian head. It has kind of ear flaps that hang down. And, you know, when you, when you buy these kind of in the tourist market in Cusco, there's always a bit of, of knitting that kind of, uh, uh, doesn't fit our, our round normal heads, uh, but it certainly seems to have been designed for uh, folks whose heads uh, underwent uh, cranial modification. Now we're going to talk a little bit about violence, how we can see violence in the bioarchaeological record. 
Now, the key, bones haven't changed a lot in the last 25,000 years, and especially in the last five to 8,000 years. So what the same kind of processes that we use in ancient case studies, we can use in historic ones, and we can actually also use them in forensic case studies. I'm gonna talk about two types of trauma, perimortem trauma and antemortem trauma. And I'm gonna use this uh, remnant of a skull that has both uh, to, uh, as, an, as, a, as a teaching tool. Okay, so there's, there's our fancy, uh, <laughs> our, uh, this is about as fancy as the graphics get. So here's a skull superimposed on that image or an image of a cranium so you can see what we're looking at. So first I wanna draw your attention to the area here with the blue dots around it. That's what we, this, can you see how, we're, what we're looking at is the, uh, the, the superior part of the eye orbit, right? Right above the eye. And can you see how it's kind of divoted in? It's definitely deformed. It's definitely, uh, you know, when we feel our own kind of, uh, our own what are called supraorbital margins, they're smooth. They definitely don't have this kind of texture. You may also be able to see that part of this is uh, actually stitching together. So that's, and that stitching together of bone that we see, that's a sign of anti-mortem trauma. Anti-mortem trauma is trauma, like a cranial fracture, a broken bone, that occurred uh, before death and, and healed. An individual who has anti-mortem trauma survives. So if any of you have ever broken an arm or a leg, you have some anti-mortem trauma. I want to contrast that with perimortem trauma. Perimortem trauma is an injury or a wound that occurs at or around the time of death and may be related to the cause of death. In this case, it's clear that this particular individual survived one hit to the skull uh, and then uh, a few years later suffered a devastating, devastating injury that literally took off half this individual's face. So, why is this important? I'm gonna bring out some skulls here. When we're looking at kind of broken bones, they can give us an idea in terms of kind of the motive of the assailant or the etiology or the cause of this trauma. So, for example, we tend to see I don't know about you, I broke my ankle once and, you know, here's a tibia and a fibula. And, you know, some maybe, maybe you guys have broken your ankle and you have a spiral fracture uh, on your, these are the lower leg bones. And when you get a, you know, a break, something like a break to your ankle, that tends to be the result of an accident. At least it was in my case. There are other types of bones uh, that when we see breaks, they indicate not violence, but, but accidents. And, and one of them is called a collie's fracture. Uh, this is a lower arm bone. It's a radius, okay? And it kind of sits like this in our body. And it has a, a, little, a little piece that points out. And that point is called the styloid process. Now, uh, usually, if someone is, is falling, what do they do? They put their hands out. They put their hands out to protect them when they're falling. And that leads to what's called a collie's fracture, which is the break of this distal area, this kind of wrist area of the bone. So when we see things like broken ankles, when we see things like collie's fractures on wrist bones, those tend to be the results of accidents. That's not the case with other types of injuries. There's another lower, uh, lower bone injury that's actually a sign of a defensive wound. This is the other, we have two bones in our lower arm. We have our radius, which I just showed you, and this is the ulna. Now, sometimes what we see is that when someone is defending themselves from a blow, they get what's called a nightstick fracture or a peri fracture. It's a defensive wound. It's a wound to this distal end, still kind of the lower portion of my uh, lower arm and it is a, 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 a good sign that someone has, has raised their arms in defense and instead of hitting the head or the face, they've gotten, they've gotten the arm. So that's a, a defensive injury if you see a nightstick fracture or a peri fracture. Sometimes we also see rib fractures and rib fracture is a little bit difficult because they can be the results of accidents. Certainly people can fall or break their ribs or today people have car accidents and break their ribs, uh, but it can also be uh, 
indicative of violence, uh, people who suffer beatings, people who suffer uh, uh, chronic abuse. When we're looking for signs uh, of abuse, of, of violence that is chronic, we're actually looking not just for one fracture of the rib, or not just, uh, but, but fractures on different ribs at different stages of healing, suggesting those injuries were re uh, received uh, periodically over time. And, and that is uh, clinically indicative of, uh, of, of chronic and violent abuse. Another type of injury we can get is actually from, from throwing a punch. It's called a boxer's fracture. I'll do it with my skeleton here. And when you, you know, when you put your hand in a fist and it, it comes against something hard, what tends to happen is you tend to break these bones. These bones called the metacarpals, especially that fourth metacarpal if your knuckles aren't, if your thumbs are in especially. So uh, this, is an, this is a sign that maybe someone actually took an offensive motion. But usually what we're seeing is not the assailants, we're seeing what happened to the, uh, the victims. So I'm going to show you some examples now of cranial trauma. And cranial trauma, more than anything else, is a sign of violence. Again, when you fall, you put your hands out to protect you. If you're, um, if you're defending yourselves, again, you put your arms up. We, we kind of instinctively defend our faces, defend our heads, cover our heads, protect ourselves. So when we see injuries or wounds to those areas, that is more indicative of violence, intentional violence, than it is accidental injury. All right. So let's look at blunt force trauma, right? Blunt force trauma um, at today is something like a, a baseball bat or a crowbar. Uh, it can also be a fist. It can be a rock. 800 years ago, they were things like this mace head here um, or these sling stones over here. Uh, they still did the same damage. So let's focus on some of these wounds, uh, these blunt force trauma wounds that nonetheless were survivable. Okay, so here's a very common one. It's a broken nose. Can you see where the green arrows show uh, kind of the displacement of the bone? If the bone is displaced to the left, that probably means, you know, the, the, the force was actually coming from the direction of the arrow. When we see this a lot, for example, uh, in cases of uh, domestic violence, we tend to see uh, uh, females with a lot of facial injuries, broken and rebroken noses, maybe broken cheeks, and also broken anterior dentition, that is their front teeth. Those are some of the signs of uh, chronic abuse, at least when we see this in, in females. When we see this in teenage boys, eh, maybe they, were, uh, they got into a, you know, into a bar brawl in ancient Peru. Here's another example of healed trauma. Can you see that uh, there's kind of a, a, a deformation right at the bottom of the eye orbit and really an area that's kind of just above your cheekbone? The arrows are indicating that. I also want you to note that this person is a dentalist. They have no teeth. All their teeth have rotten and fallen out. What's really interesting is not that this, uh, you know, not is that this is actually that this person lived. They had this horrible facial wound, which they survived uh, for several years, long enough for it to kind of heal. It didn't heal perfectly because they didn't have orthopedic surgeons, but someone, someone had to help kind of set that bone. Someone had to help. This person had no teeth. How do they eat? Someone must have been, you know, maybe gumming their food for them or turning food into porridge. What does that indicate to an anthropologist? It indicates care. It indicates that people who are experiencing violence are still trying to care for one another. There's a humanity in this. Here's another injury. This is actually a cheekbone that looks like it's been uh, uh, kind of sliced in half. And again, it, it, it's, it hasn't healed. And sometimes you'll see this kind of, this, this you'll see uh, in ancient samples, especially bones that haven't healed well. Um, and that's because they, they did not have, you know, again, internal fixation. They didn't have penicillin. They didn't have a lot of things that we have today. Here's another guy. Now this person has, what is that? An injury to the left side of the face. If you get an injury to the left side of the face, that's usually from an attack by a right-handed assailant. 
And this was a, a pretty big blow for this individual. Everywhere there's an, or, uh, an, an arrow, there is a, is a fracture. So this person had some kind of, you know, a major blunt force trauma that really kind of crunched in the whole left side of his face. Here's another view. You can see how the, uh, how even the nasal bones, the, the bones of the nose have not even, and will never fuse again. The wide teal arrow, do you see that kind of honeycomb pattern? That's not supposed to look like that. That's supposed to be an even sheet of bone. And you know what goes through that area? Your optic, <laughs> your optic canal, that's your optic nerve. So it's, it's, it is, uh, more than likely that this individual was blinded by this attack. They still lived. Now I'm going to show you some examples of blunt force trauma that was lethal, that was deadly, that occurred at or around the time of death. Why do I say at or around the time of death? Because, uh, because the wound, bodies can still be fresh when a bone breaks. So, the diff so when we see patterns I'll go over here. When we see patterns of perimortem lethal trauma, we're looking for different signs. We're not looking for that bone or signs that it's stitching up or, or even if it's not kind of getting calloused and, and, and healing to some extent, even if it's not set. Blunt force trauma occurred, again, while the body was still fresh, for lack of a better word. And, we, we, and so there's certain diagnostics that we'll use. Some of those diagnostics, for example, is what we call hinging of bone. Can you see right here how the bone, it's a, it's a cranial fracture, the bone, it's a depressed cranial fracture, the bone is actually divoted in. But because that bone was still fresh, it was still embedded in soft tissue, whether it was just before death or whether it was just after death, uh, there was kind of enough tension, that bone was still wet. So instead of breaking like a dried piece of chalk or a dried tree branch, uh, we actually see the hinging of bone. And that is, that is key for identifying perimortem trauma. Another thing we can uh, identify, in fact, uh, on the other image right here, we also see hinging of bone. In fact, what we're looking at here, if you see this little nub, that little nub is called the mastoid process. If you feel right behind your ear, you'll feel like a little knuckle of bone. That's your mastoid process. Now, what's interesting is that mastoid process is different among males and females. Males tend to have big bulky mastoid processes and females tend to have uh, ones that are kind of more gracile, they're smaller. And just based on looking just at the bulkiness, that's definitely a male. So we have our point of impact. We have our hinging of bone. We have color continuity. Color continuity between the broken and the intact bone, that means it occurred at the same time. If the bone color is different, it probably means it broke sometime well after death when the bone was already dry and decaying. But this all happened when everything was enmeshed in soft tissue. Radiating fracture lines are another key of perimortem trauma. Here, every radiating fracture line I've illustrated in this, uh, 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 on this example uh, with kind of these blue lines. The radiating fracture lines, think about you know, a baseball going through a window. You know, what happens? It cracks, right? And it goes into kind of a spider web pattern. They're concentric patterns. The same thing happens with a human skull when you have blunt force trauma. And so what we're seeing is literally the cracks in the window. Here's another case of, uh, of uh, blunt force trauma. Now, uh, the arrow is pointing to some of the hinged bone. Uh, the color is the same, so we know it's perimortem. Uh, we can, and which I've highlighted in blue, in yellow I've highlighted the radiating fracture line. And actually, the shape of the weapon is, uh, is consistent with sling stones they, we find. And so in this case, and in some cases, sometimes we can actually estimate or guess the weapon used. I'm trying to think what happened. We can also say something about the position of the victim and their assailant at the moment of impact. Uh, in this case, um, if it is a sling stone, uh, it's coming from a distance and this person, you know, this might have been a situation where uh, they looked up and it hit them right between, that, that trauma hit them right between the eyes. Um, and it suggests that at least at the moment of impact is that they were looking kind of at the source of where that aggression was coming from. 
Uh, it's kind of the same size as this egg. Um, oh gosh, I'm gonna try to do this. So it's something I do this with my students. I hope, <laughs> we'll try it this way. <laughs> I'll show you this later, but you know how an egg cracks? The same thing will happen to your skull. I'll show that later. Glad it didn't, it is a hard boiled egg, so that's good. Here's another image of violence that's kind of interesting. We have uh, our yellow dot, right, and our kind of teal colored dot. I wanna focus on the yellow first. So here's an injury again. We see the radiating fracture lines. We see kind of how the bone is kind of beveled in as if someone was kind of puncturing it. And indeed, it's consistent in size with sling stones that we find in the archeological record. This is the other wound. Uh, it's, a, it's a view of the back of the skull, and it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, this wound is also, was also received at or around the time of death, um, but it's different. Uh, the wound before, the wound on the top of the head, uh, was pro you know, it could have been from, you know, it could have been from a, uh, well, it's more like a sling stone because it didn't do a ton of damage. Uh, I mean, it did damage. That kind of injury would have, you know, knocked someone out, certainly made them unconscious. But the interesting thing about that other head wound is, is this is something different. This is actually, this is definitely kind of blunt force trauma from a mace head or something like, this is a plastic skull, um, a mace head. And, and so what it suggests is that, you know, this person was down and out with that, with that, you know, that first break on their head and someone came back and finished the job. In fact, when we started to look at this area of Peru and in this time period, in this dark age, we started to see lots of interesting patterns that we typically don't see in cases of ancient warfare or even, you know, modern kind of crime. We see um, that uh, people are targeted for this, this very kind of destructive violence. That's not just one blow, that's several blows. It's not just men who are targeted, and that's usually the case, right? In, in modern warfare, men are the combatants. In this case, though, we see women and children who tend to be non-combatants being targeted for violence, having their, their bodies physically destroyed. We also see that people are targeting the frail, the sick, and the elderly. This is important because that those people in society who are most vulnerable, they're not gonna take up arms against a, uh, you know, an, an army. So what it suggests is that uh, these people are not being killed because they are um, rival warriors, but because of their, perhaps their social identity, their ethnic identity, something about them, something about the men, the women, the children, the frail, the sick and the elderly, they all share something that is causing an assailant, an unknown assailant, to literally beat them to death. And so we see this pattern and we started seeing it again and again and again. And again, this is, this is, this is what we call in forensic anthropology kind of overkill violence, right? It only takes one hit with a, with a mace to kill someone. But what's happening, these people are being hit again and again and again. There's a physical destruction here. There's a, there's a, it's almost a form of symbolic violence. There's a rage, there's a hatred. These, these people would have been unrecognizable. And in a culture that's where mummification is important, where you can literally recognize someone 800 years later, a destroyed skull doesn't leave much behind for descendants to memorialize. There's also this really interesting injury that I kept seeing again and again. And I looked everywhere I could look. And on this kind of injury, can you see the hole on the base of the skull? That's called a ring fracture. And I was looking in the clinical literature, here's your first vertebrae, and it kind of sits in here, right at the base of your head. And what I saw, you know, I started looking at, and the clinical literature called this fracture ring fracture. And they said, you know, we see it normally in cases of, um, uh, suicide when people uh, you know jump off a building and they either land on their head or, or I'm sorry they land on their feet or they land kind of on um, on their sit bones um, and on your kind of where your sacrum is and that force causes what's called the inferior the basal portion of uh, the the skull to fracture so it's literally one the shock wave of one bone hitting the other but there were no tall buildings in ancient Peru. And if someone was gonna fall down a mountain, they wouldn't get a ring fracture. They'd get 
kind of, you know, and everything for everything would be fractured. So I looked and I looked and I looked. And the closest kind of analog I could find to this particular type of fracture was from the 1970s, uh, from the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. In those cases, we actually have oral testimony of people who, are, who survived. And they said, people who got that wound, what happened to them? They were, uh, their hands were tied, uh, they were usually blindfolded, their head was down, they were in a position of total submission, and then they were beaten on the back of the head, usually by a rifle butt, because the Khmer deemed bullets, you know, too expensive, and these people were not worth the price of a bullet. It's chilling that we see that again. So what does this suggest? This suggests a very particular type of violence we're seeing in ancient Peru, a type of violence that today we would classify as a massacre or as, as genocidal violence. And indeed, there are some hints in kind of those old colonial records about assailants attacking and killing uh, those who are vulnerable in society. I'll end with a couple slides that on a, on a somewhat positive note, that even in this kind of horrific violence that people were experiencing, uh, they still tried to cope with the reality of their times. They wanted to live. And one of the ways they did that was through uh, trepanation, which is ancient cranial surgery. Now, what's interesting is that uh, ancient cranial surgery, in this population, we looked at about, oh, 250, 300 uh, crania, and about 13% of the population showed signs of this, this brain surgery, this cranial surgery. I'm sure 13% of us here gathered today have, do not, uh, we don't represent a rate that high of actually having kind of brain surgery. And in fact, of those, you know, of that 13% of society that, uh, you know, underwent this treatment, a third of them have more than one uh, surgical intervention. And in fact, we see people in this time actually experimenting with different surgical techniques. The, by far the most successful one was scraping technique. And can you see here with these two trepanations, there's kind of, there's closure, the bone of the skull, there's a dendritic or finger-like projections, the bone is healing. We look for that. So this is a trepanation. These are two surgeries, two interventions, and the, and the person lived. They lived for several years afterwards, at least. This is another form, cutting and grooving. It wasn't, it was not as successful. How do we know that? Well, uh, you know, in the last slide, we saw kind of dendritic bone growth, so like kind of the bone thinning and coming together. And here we see kind of fresh cut marks that suggest that there was no reactive bone. There was no healing that took place uh, when these cut marks um, were uh, uh, achieved. The last type of uh, uh, technique that I'll talk about is boring and drilling. This is by far the least uh, successful. And what's particularly painful in this case is that you can see here, there's four tiny drill marks where the practitioner kind of started with the drill and then stopped. So, Needless to say, this patient did not survive that surgery. So it's interesting when you kind of plot, you know, among this population where all these, you know, surgical holes are in the skull, there's an interesting pattern that comes up. We find that, you know, almost two thirds of these, uh, these interventions, trepanations are in what we call risky areas of the skull. That is, they're on a suture line or they're on your sinuses or they're on musculature. And that suggests that the, the need to modify crania was greater, uh, or I'm sorry, the need to, to intervene surgically was more important, uh, outweighed the risk of intervening on these sensitive areas. And in some cases, we can actually kind of uh, infer why that, uh, you know, why those trepanations were done. So in this, uh, you can see, for example, we have our, our, our our heel fracture. Can you see that cranial fracture? It's actually stitched together. And then we have a trepanation, a scallop-shaped scallop hole, right? What probably was done is that this individual got a head wound. It might have been in that location where the trepanation hole is, and the practitioner on the battlefield moving through hair and tissue and 
who knows what else, uh, you know, gets, you know, takes off, you know, the, the scalp, gets to the bone, and then has a, a toolkit, if you will, to, to lift and elevate uh, pieces of bone that have fallen into the skull. It also relieves the pressure. We do this even, doctors even do this today, they create boreholes. Uh, the idea is that if you get a head trauma, your brain swells, and, you know, uh, that swelling, if it, the pressure is not released, can lead to the death of the patient. So it looks like they were doing that. Now, sometimes they were successful. So, for example, in this case, uh, the arrow is pointing to the remnants of a heel, uh, radiating fracture line, and we see kind of the nice, smooth edges of uh, a healing, uh, healed uh, uh, trepanation. And, you know, in some cases, uh, cranial blown is kind of the slowest to heal. So, you know, it might have stayed like that forever. Very few close completely. This is another case. This individual was not so lucky. Again, we can see the point of impact. We see that radiating fracture line. And then, unfortunately, what we see here for this individual uh, are cut marks such that uh, where, you know, someone looks like they are, it shows to me a sign of urgency, urgently cutting. It was not successful. We also see about 10% of trepanations over areas of diseased bone. In this case, these kind of look like caries sicca. That's usually um, uh, a sign of uh, uh, a signature of syphilis, um, but it can be also uh, different kinds of uh, infections can, can cause these kind of long-term scarring. And in both cases, we can see kind of cut marks or uh, drills. Uh, ultimately, the patient did not survive, but they were placed over, um, again, areas of infected bone. And in some cases, we don't find anything. But we do have uh, clues from Peruvian oral history um, and folklore talking about uh, uh, the Inca suffering, for example, from Sonjo Nanay, which was their word for uh, epilepsy. I don't know if any of you, uh, they also suffered from fright sickness, where the, the, the soul would escape. And sometimes to get it back in, the idea was that you would drill a hole back in and the soul would, would travel back into your body uh, through that hole in your head. And I don't know, if any of you have ever had a migraine, sometimes it's just like, I wish someone could drill a hole in my head to get rid of this pressure. So there are certainly kind of unknown etiologies too. What's interesting is that overall, 66%, two thirds of patients ended up at least surviving for several weeks, several months, if not years after the surgery. Equal rates uh, were not achieved in Europe for another 1,500 years. And that's probably because uh, the tools people were using, they were actually, uh, practitioners were probably making them on the fly. They had a hunk of obsidian and they, you know, they, uh, they flaked it into a sharp edge. And that was a sterile, that was a, a sterile uh, cutting uh, implement. Uh, they weren't in hospitals, they were outside. So kind of the bacterial infections that we see plague medieval Europe uh, were not here uh, in, on the, you know, the pastures of the high Andes. Here's a trepanation, good prognosis. You can see kind of the healing. Here's a, some other types of trepanation. We see those, those, those sharp edges, no signs of healing, no signs of bony reaction, uh, did not survive, poor prognosis. We also see signs of what looks like kind of postmortem uh, experimentation. So this individual has a healing trepanation, so uh, when, uh, several years before death. And then what we see here is an incredible uh, attempt to drill into this person's skull, and it looks like it didn't work. But I think there's something else going on here. When we actually look at these, uh, these holes, these bore holes, as we go back in the skull, they actually get a little bit deeper every time. And what I think it has happening is kind of the equivalent of a Peruvian med school student. It's probably the night before his final exam. He's kind of with his hand drill on this, on this, 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 this skull of an already dead person. And actually kind of how many turns of the drill does it take before I get through the cranial diplo, but before I hit the brain? Because if someone hits the brain or the meninges, the patient is lost. Here's another case where someone it looks like was a... Uh, uh, practicing with a diverse toolkit. So we see here, we actually see polishing of the bone. That's what the uh, pink arrow is showing. And that polishing only comes from, you know, the grease of human hands touching the skull uh, for uh, years. Someone, we, we think, I think this is also a case of experimentation. 
uh, maybe familiarization with techniques, trying to improve techniques. We see kind of drill bits of different size. You can see that with the yellow arrows. Um, we also see kind of different patterns. We see some big parabolic patterns. Some, it looks like trying to make a plug. Someone certainly seems to be experimenting. And indeed, just like the last photo, both of these are, are these are all post-mortem. These are dry. They don't show any of those radiating fractures. So they occurred after death. We also see some in, an instance of cranioplasty. Cranioplasty is literally, uh, in this case, a metal plate in, in the head. I mentioned before that trepanations, even if they heal, they won't fully clothe. So what happened? Well, to protect that area of literally kind of the brain and nothing else, it's possible uh, that uh, cranioplasties like these were actually woven into those hats, providing a measure of security. So, you know, I kind of want to end here and open it up for questions, but kind of my takeaway message is that, you know, we've seen, we've seen some violence, we've seen some surgery, we've seen some death and destruction, um, but we also see the capacity of a people to experiment and to innovate as a means of coping with calamity. And I think that's something that we as a society do every time we're faced with natural or social disasters. We cope, we innovate, and we take tragedy and hopefully we learn from it. And hopefully we make the lives of those around us a little better. So I wanna thank you. I hope you consider UCSB. I'd love to see any of you in my class, either remotely or even better in person. Uh, but nonetheless, it's thank you for the opportunity for uh, letting me share my work with you. And I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Professor. That was fascinating. Wow. Um, we do have some questions. So the first one is, how can you tell perimortem trauma from damage to the skeleton after death? Great, great question. Okay, so um, actually I have, my little dog is helping me out here. I got a lamb shank bone and uh, uh, she's been gnawing on it. And um, one of the ways we can tell that uh, this occurred after death is that the, uh, the bone is uh, a different color. That means the rest of the bone was kind of dry and then she kind of broke it off. And because she broke off another piece and there wasn't kind of, it wasn't enmeshed in, in muscle or soft tissue, it has a different color. It was also with dry bone, we don't see uh, the radiating fracture lines, we don't see the hinging of bone, and we don't see color continuity uh, between uh, broken and intact bone. There's an experiment you can do now that it's springtime. Go out and find a dry stick right out in the park. If you break it, it'll break like chalk and both ends, you know, it will be kind of like the, the color of the woods inside. Then try to break uh, a, a branch from a living tree. What happens? It, it, it's hard. That green branch doesn't break. It doesn't snap. In fact, if it's, it, when it breaks, it kind of breaks like that. It breaks uneven. And the same thing happens with bone. Uh, when bone is fresh and wet and near the time of death, or uh, we see that kind of, this kind of green stick action. When bones, uh, which causes the radiating fracture, the hinging. When bone is dry, like a dry stick, like a dry piece of chalk, it'll just kind of break in half. There won't be kind of any order to the break itself. Great. Thank you. Um, so a question, how, if at all, does the work that you do working with like ancient bones and ancient skeletons differ from modern forensic anthropology? That's a great question. So forensic anthropology is really an applied science uh, that uh, is used in a, a medical or, or a kind of juro or criminal or legalistic uh, 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 application. So when we're, as forensic anthropologists, we're looking at stuff, usually it tends to be recent within the last, oh, what's our oldest cold case? About 50, 60 years old. So we're looking for that in kind of forensic cases. And we're, we're actually looking to kind of put an identity on that person, to actually identify them, give them a first name, a last name, a social security number. That's different with bioarchaeology. When we're dealing with the ancient dead, uh, you know, we... <laughs> barring someone with a tattoo saying, I'm, I'm this person, we're never going to know the names of these people. And, uh, you know, while we can learn things from individual case studies as bioarchaeologists, our, real, our goal is actually, is not necessarily to identify who these people were, but to use our knowledge and our reading of these bones to answer questions of social significance. 
So, you know, what was life and death like? How did people cope with violence? What happened when society collapsed uh, 800 years ago? And so that's the, that's the major difference, but they're really interchangeable. And I send as many students to anthropology grad schools for bioarchaeology, forensic anthropology, and med school. Uh, so it really is, uh, uh, anthropology really does provide, uh, and bioarchaeology in particular, kind of a, an opening to a whole world of understanding human bodies as biological things, but also cultural things. Wonderful. Um, so we've got some more questions coming in. Um, someone has asked, during this time period, were bones used in decorations or in ritual settings? Fantastic question. Yes, they were. And so some of the ways we see that, for example, is we'll see, we found instances, for example, of ribs, human ribs, and the ribs actually have holes drilled in them. And so they were probably hung from a necklace. That's a, what we do is we actually look at the DNA of the bone and actually and what that, and, and the person who was wearing it. And we can use that to see is that, you know, what is the relationship between, you know, this trophy and uh, the individual? Is it a relic, you know, the way people used to collect like the finger bones of saints? Um, are these the bones of, of ancestors? You know, in a, in a society that doesn't have writing, one of the ways to show your affiliation is by, uh, by literally uh, bringing, you know, the mummy of your grandfather out. In other cases, we can, we find, we do isotopic testing and we find that, you know, the individual has a certain kind of uh, chemical signature in their body, which indicates kind of what they ate, where they lived. Um, the adage kind of, you are what you eat is not so far fetched. And, and sometimes what we'll do is we'll compare that kind of biochemical signature, kind of the componential elemental elements of the bones. And what we can see is that we can actually see people who are eating different diets, people who are living at different elevations, people who are living in different geological areas. And so when we see a difference, we can assume that, uh, we can cautiously assume that uh, any trophy we see is, is probably from an enemy and not from an ancestor or, or from a saint. Wonderful. Um, ooh, a good question here. What is the most surprising or jarring speci specimen that you've ever come across in your work and what was unique about it? Wow, excellent question. <sighs> That's, wow. <laughs> um, Hmm. I, I, sometimes I guess, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not off. Sometimes it's, it's not like the flashiest, um, you know, it's not the flashiest, uh, sometimes specimen that gives you memories, but the one that in my case, that gives me a visceral reaction. And, um, what I remember, I, I, we actually found a, a, a skeleton and, and the bone, the legs, the leg bones were fused together, kind of almost oh, bent totally. Um, and this was probably a case, could have been a case of, I don't know, syphilis, or I'm sorry, tuberculosis, it, uh, septic arthritis. Um, and I had, I, had, I had been in the Andes and I'd, I'd broken my leg out in the field. And, you know, it gave me a as I was kind of sit, sitting there, you know, kind of crawling misery style to like to field projects, it gave me um, an appreciation for the fact that these people survived. The fact that uh, when I see these bones, these bones that are, or these skulls that are just beaten into pulp, I have such respect for the resiliency of the community, of the descendant community that beyond all expectations and all odds have survived and are indeed even thriving now. So sometimes it's those, it's those, you know, <laughs> we, we're all skeletons, right? You know, sometimes it's those kind of visceral experiences that you, uh, that are most kind of influential because they kind of change the way you think. And in that case, it, it turned from something like very clinical where I dissociated this, you know, this is, I'm a doctor, these are the bones, to something like, wow, I see that and, and I hurt. So, yeah. Thank you. And we've got two more and then we'll wrap up. Um, so you were talking about these, these um, ancient Peruvian, these cranial surgeries and these different techni techniques and these trials. 
Do you find that they were more advanced than other methods that were happening at the same time? Or were there even similar uh, uh, techniques happening? Fantastic question too. This is, uh, you know what, this is really a, a, a question that uh, very, that, that is very hard to answer. Other than this sample that I showed you today, this is, this is kind of the, the largest sample in the world of crania with trepanations that were actually excavated from a primary context. Uh, we know of six to 800 examples of trepanations in, mostly in Peru, some in Bolivia, some not in Ecuador, uh, but most primarily uh, Peru. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we see this surgery, uh, but in, in, you know, these 99% of cases, uh, we're studying these things in museum collections because 100 years ago, 150 years ago, uh, they were looted and they eventually found their way to collections. So it's really hard for us when we just have a head in a, you know, a skull in a museum cabinet, no labels, no nothing. It's really hard for us to say, well, do we see innovation? And I think what's cool about this collection is that we can actually do radiocarbon dates. We can actually look at the DNA. We can see what they're eating, you know? Um, we can see, you know, the wounds they accumulated over their lifetime. And we can actually see in what looks like experimentation and improvements over time. Two thirds is a really high uh, survival rate overall. What I don't understand is once they realized that one type didn't work, like the drilling and boring, why, why did they continue to do it? Hopefully, maybe it's something that one of you guys will answer when you come here. All right, and the last question I think is a great one to end on. Um, I think at this point we're all really excited and, and Looking forward to taking classes with you, myself included. I would love to. Um, so what classes do you teach here at UCSB? So I'm currently teaching the anthropology of disaster. So we're talking about how human bodies are affected from everything from volcano blasts to epidemics to industrial accidents and, you know, uh, the, the impacts of uh, pollution, plane crashes and prostitutes. So it's a pretty uh, wild course. I also teach human osteology. Uh, which is the study of the human skeleton. And in 10 weeks, you memorize thousands of terms and, um, and uh, the method works. Uh, it's my favorite class to teach because it's the one that students tell me they've seen the most growth from where they started to where they end. So I really like that. Uh, the sense of uh, the, the achievement and the accomplishment of the students is, is pretty incredible. I teach forensic anthropology. I teach bioarchaeology. I teach human evolution. Um, and I, uh, I also have uh, student interns. So I have dozens of students every year who are interested in another topic, a, a different topic, and, and they intern with me either working with bone collections themselves or kind of answering a question through searching through the archives and, and you know, museum collections. So welcome. <laughs> it's great to hear that the students have a lot of opportunities to learn from you. Um, so Professor, thank you so much for your time this evening. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who joined us.